The frugal Congregationalist walked into the house panting and almost completely exhausted. What happened, honey? inquired his wife. It's a great new idea I have to be a better steward of our resources, he gasped. I ran all the way home from the church's trustees meeting behind the bus and I saved a dollar fifty. Well, that wasn't very bright, replied his frustrated wife. Why didn't you run behind a taxi and save twenty? <laughs> We're always so helpful with each other, aren't we? <laughs> now is the time that you may help the ministry and missions of this community. Your offerings are an important part of the financial health of this congregation. Thank you, Helen. That was beautiful. <clears throat> so I don't know if you know this, but uh, we have three dogs. Uh, we got them all pretty much um, unintentionally, but they live with us. Uh, three wild beasts that run with crazed abandon through our home. Well, at least when Dwayne or I come home, and then things calm down pretty quickly when they discover that we didn't bring them any treats. One night this past week, Dwayne remarked that Grover, our big, lovable 90-pound mutt, no longer had some scabs on his head where he had scratched so hard as to break the skin while he waited, and we waited, for his allergy shot to take effect. And it seems that the allergy shot worked because he stopped messing with the scabs long enough that they could heal. And now, with some medicine and some time, the beast is better. Grover sleeps through the night again, no small feat for an older dog in a new house. But he's back to his old ways of being a, a big love and eating every single unprotected roll of toilet paper he can find. <laughs> Ingrate. All it took for Grover's itches to heal was a little time and some medicine, both balms to the body and the spirit. 
And time and medicine are good for us all, even us mere humans, when we need some healing. When we ache, we take some medicine, give it time to work, and usually we feel better. I also believe that this can be applied to our relationships as well. Sometimes our relationships become strained, even broken. And when that happens, sometimes we can repair the relationship with a little medicine and a little time. And in this case, the medicine is love. I think we could take this idea one step further and apply that same balm when our relationship, our sacred covenant with the Holy One, is broken. Let's use our covenant here as UCC as an example. We clearly state that when we join this congregation, we will journey together using the ways of Jesus as our guide. And on occasion, almost always unintentionally, because we are human, we do things that damage that relationship. Our covenant between God and our covenant among ourselves. And we usually know when we've done that because we have a gut reaction. We've given this reaction a a psychological name when I believe it is a spiritual condition. We're bothered by our conscience. We're reminded that what we did was wrong. We, We can't sync up the event that happened, the crisis that damaged the relationship with how we wish to be in the world. We failed to journey in the ways of Jesus. So what happens when an entire community damages, ruptures, disrupts its covenant with the Holy One? I'm glad you asked. The story of the Jewish people seems to be one of never-ending conflict, of victory and submission, of multiple diasporas that saw these people flung to the ends of the earth as if the seeds of a dandelion. Most of the earliest stories recorded by the Hebrew people came from their time spent enslaved by the Babylonians who had destroyed their kingdom and taken most of their people into captivity. The prophet Jeremiah calls attention to this Babylonian exile in in many places in his prophetic book. But there is one passage that scholars believe could be a first-person account of the destruction of the temple in 586 when Babylon destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah. Hear now these words from the prophet Jeremiah that caught my eye. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Is there no balm in Gilead? Meaning, does not the Holy One have a way to heal us, to save us? In the region of Moab of Ruth fame, the town of Gilead was a well-known place to obtain all sorts of medicinal balms and other healing items. The phrase is understood that Yahweh had the means if only the way were shown that perennial cry of the Jewish people, of all oppressed peoples, where is our Mashiach? Where is our Messiah? Where is our Savior? Who will save us? You could begin to see why the Jewish people might think that their covenant with the Holy One has been broken. Much of their history is an endless cycle of being in right relationship with God and being out of right relationship, and then struggling back, trying to get back into right relationship with God. Remember, the Jewish agreement, the Jewish covenant, was that if they obeyed Yahweh and kept God's precepts and laws, Yahweh would bless Abraham and all of his descendants. That's the promise, the covenant. But then a community member misses the mark does something that besmirches the entire community. And with that, they believe 
they're out of the Holy One's favor. And we know when that happens, all sorts of nasty things are going to transpire. This is what it meant in antiquity to be in covenant with a divine entity. For a cynic, it looks like a potent tool to keep people in line. Do as you are instructed, and God will not harm your community. But do something to anger our God, do something to damage our covenant, our relationship with Yahweh, and we've got a problem on our hands. How, then, are we to repair that relationship? How do we return to covenant with God and with each other? How do we bridge this gap between us, between Yahweh, between humanity? That might be the theological question. In her book, After the Rain, author Alexandra L. writes this, No relationship is perfect, and they all aren't worth, and they aren't all worth repair. But finding the discernment to push through and gain insight from our experiences and connections can be where we find the depths of what we can withstand and overcome. Obviously written from a place of healing. Here was a woman who had gone through struggles and suffered emotional abuse and neglect most of her life, and she found a way to heal through her writing, her poetry, her prose, her books, such as After the Rain, which in it she gives us practical and often beautiful advice on how to deal with life after an upheaval, a family crisis, a broken relationship, anything that needs soothing. She offers ideas and words that can act as a sort of balm for our troubles. And then we take the time to let the medicine work. And then, hopefully, you're able to lift yourself out of your bed and walk forth securely, as the choir sang, or as the disabled man that Jesus commanded to pick up his mat and walk, which he did. Remember, Jesus didn't walk over and lift the man up. And he didn't stand there and scold him. He did say, you are healed. Stand up, take your mat, and walk. And the man did. The man started his healing because he had faith in the balm of Jesus' words and teachings. And just what did Jesus say about all of this healing? He taught that the most critical component of healing is forgiveness, the forgiveness of others and the forgiveness of ourselves. He taught that the forgiveness required for healing was this medicine. And then you take the time to let it work its magic. To illustrate this, Jesus told a rather troublesome par parable. Let's hear this version found in Matthew. This is the parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Sidebar. How many times do we forgive someone? Twice. Three times, right? So he, here's Peter going, am I to forgive him seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since the man was unable to pay, the king ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master, the king, took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, and he grabbed him, and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But the man refused. Instead, he went and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and they told their master, the king, everything that had happened. 
Then the king called that servant back in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master, the king, handed him over to the jailers to be tortured and he, till he could pay back all that he owed. Jesus then ends this parable with this line. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Harsh. How many of you feel that the servant got what he deserved? How many of you think that sending a human to a place to be tortured regardless of their crime is inhumane punishment and doesn't fit the crime? How many of you are sitting out there grateful that you're not a judge who has to sit in a courtroom every day and hear similar stories play out? Oh, wait, I forget. Many of you are parents, so you know this well. You have sat in judgment of so many venial sins and then had to meet and met out those judgments. Kids have a finely tuned sense of justice, one that they learned from you. How many of you felt just a little schadenfreude when that servant got in trouble? He earned his comeuppance. That fills some of us with glee, or at least a feeling that justice was done. But who's justice, I ask? Jesus himself said that the Holy One would send healing, would send a balm. Is this what the parable means? Healing, in this case, requires each party to be treated equally? Maybe not. It's argued that the king in this story is a Gentile, living under the protection of the Herodian dynasty and probably one of Herod's better tax collectors. But the king in this story probably did not do any collecting himself. In fact, uh, Bernard Brandon Scott and many others argue that the servant in the story probably did the tax collecting for the king. The king then took his cut, sent the remainder on to Herod, who took his cut and sent what was left to Rome. But don't forget, the servant would have padded the amount owed on the tax as well. So, you know, guys got to earn a living, right? And you can begin to see why tax collectors were a despised lot. But the question remains, should we accept the same treatment in all of our transactions? If I am forgiven, shouldn't I forgive? If I am healed by your kind words, shouldn't I turn right around and bless and heal others who have been damaged by my words? I think an apology is a type of balm. We give it, and we give it time. We aren't going to heal anything until we learn to listen to one another really listen, until we all have empathy with each other, until we are gentle and loving with each other. All of the medicine in the world won't work if your heart is a stone and you have already made up your mind. If you have already judged the situation and you refuse to budge one inch from your position, you're stuck. That too requires some healing. Jesus said it best, and he wasn't giving us a number that we have to meet. It's not a quota. You don't have to stand there with a 